Hi, I'm Flynn Berry, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Lynn Bay. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I am your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please click on the subscribe links over on the right-hand sidebar. You can subscribe on your Android phone, your iPhone, it's Stitcher Radio, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find Author Stories. We're also on YouTube. There's a link over in the right ha- right-hand sidebar as well. And you can subscribe there and never miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by the AIPP, the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. If you are an indie author and you need to build a support team to help you uh, format your book, edit your book, get a cover designed for your book, the anything that an indie author needs to get their book out there, the AIPP has a member that can help you make your book your product the very best it can be. If you look in the uh, show notes at the bottom of this episode, you'll find a link to the AIPP or go to aippconline.org slash members and browse through the member library and find the professional to fill out your team. Like I said, anything that you need to make your indie publishing journey a success, there's a member there to help. It's a very simple website, very easy to navigate through. Go check out AIPPonline.org slash members today and fill out your indie author team. At the end of the show, be sure to stick around for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with Book One, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps One find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE SmackDown with the legions of a boss-level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl, well, an empress. Now destiny's calling in a death. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these Marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together. And this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Flynn Berry on the show with me today. She has a brand new book called A Double Life, and this is a fascinating psychological suspense book that uh, if you're looking for that book to end your summer vacation, uh, this is the book to grab. Uh, welcome to the show, Flynn. Thank you so much. Yeah, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? My first memory of wanting to be a writer is one of my first memories. I remember writing a story uh, down on a yellow legal pad, and um, I remember a description of a tree in it. (laughs) Uh, But it's one of those things that I've just always known that I wanted to do. And I think it comes from loving reading so much and reading being such a central part of my life. What kind of things did you love to read when you were uh, young? I read uh, everything I could get my hands on. I remember really loving the 
fairy books by Andrew Lang. So it was the violet fairy book and the yellow fairy book and the blue fairy book and just working my way through <laughs> the colors. And then I loved um, the Narnia books. I think maybe the reason why my books are set in England now is because of having read Narnia and have having had it make such a big impression on me. I, I love those books so much. I read them as a kid, and then yeah. when my kids came along, um, I, I read them with my kids. That we read out loud, and everybody piled up, you know, in a big chair together. And you know that that magic never dies. It's uh, there's there's something so special about those books. Yeah, there really is, and um, it's nice to hear that your children felt the same way about them too. Oh yeah, they're timeless. It, it's it's really crazy that uh, that those those books age so well and just captivate an entire generation all over again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that the setting in England too. Then when I went to England for the first time, I couldn't believe it actually existed. <laughs> it just seemed like this fictional landscape because of that. And I couldn't believe people were going to work and having a bad day and not just you know, over the moon that they live there. Right. Right. Like England might as well be Narnia as well. Just some, some place to exactly. a wardrobe. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. My, uh, my son, uh, who, uh, is a school teacher now, but, uh, he was, took a college trip to England and that was kind of his experience too. He's like, here's the, the place with, you know, where all the books live that I grew up reading. You know, it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so cool. Okay. Yeah. So what uh, what brought you around to uh, to writing uh, that I, I know you, you talked about the story that you wrote, but when did it become um, kind of the, the thing that you knew that you would do with your life? You know, like like a lot of us look at it as, you know, we we're storytellers, we're writers. But then there comes a point where something clicks and you're like, OK, now I'm going to pursue this, you know, as a career, as a profession, as, you know, I, I've got to get my stories out to other people. I think it was graduating from college and making the decision about where to find a job or try to find a job. And it did seem like there were kind of two options and either I could pursue writing and kind of stake everything on that, or I could get a job that would be interesting and demanding and uh, try to do writing in addition to that. And I think people can do either one, you know, like they're doctors who then end up writing wonderful yeah. books, even though they work full time and have these really challenging jobs. Um, but for me, I think it really helped to think that I would get jobs to sort of pay the bills, but that writing would be my um, career even before I sold a book or got a book deal. And I would really dedicate myself to it. What did you study in college? So I studied literary arts. So it's a combination of English and creative writing. Okay. So, so you knew before, I mean, when you started college, this is something, uh, you know, you don't just study that for nothing. That that was in, in your mind somewhere already, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the big thing and the thing that I think about still is that it's it seems impossible to get from that point of loving reading and loving writing to having a job as a writer, um, whether that's as a journalist or a um, nonfiction writer or a novelist, there just seems to be a kind of like closed door, I think in between you and that. And it just took a long time to kind of get to the point where I had an agent and a publisher. Um, and it, I remember being in college and thinking that seems completely unattainable. Right. So what was that first book that you wrote that allowed you to, uh, to get the agent and publisher, uh, and, uh, to, to kind of go along with that, did, did you write something before that, that will never see the light of day? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my. Uh, so we all have those. I wrote, yeah, I know. Right. I think, I think you have to, I mean, yeah. there are some people who I think are able to just sit down and write something and it comes out polished and it comes out how they want it to be. But I think for most people, you end up just needing to get a lot out of your system and try different things. And for me, it was figuring out what actually interests me the most. So not writing to kind of please other people or try to sound more 
literary or kind of sophisticated um, and actually just working on what fascinated me the most. So uh, I wrote a full length novel that will be buried forever (laughs) um, in my early 20s. And then I wrote Under the Harrow. And that was the first time that I really felt like the gears kind of caught finally. And I was writing about women and violence and these things that I thought about a lot. And it just felt like a completely different experience than the work I had been doing up until then. So, so tell me about Under the Harrow. Uh, what was the, the motivation for that book? And uh, tell us a little bit about it. So I started the book when I was living in Austin in Texas. And there was a home invasion murder in my neighborhood. And a young woman was murdered. And at the time, I was living in a house with two other young women And we were both terrified, or all three of us were terrified whenever we were home alone at night. And it just made me really angry to think that so many women I knew and myself uh, lived with that kind of fear or that kind of uncertainty about whether or not it was safe to sleep with a window open or walk home alone at night from the library or take a cab at two in the morning. Um, And so I started kind of as a cathartic impulse to write a story about a crime and then a woman trying to solve it. Wow. Um, was, was crime fiction or suspense, uh, you know, or thrillers, however you want to kind of parse out where your books fall. Uh, but was that something that, that, uh, that was on your mind a lot? Uh, did, did you read in the genre? Uh, why do you think this sort of story kind of bubbled out of you? Hmm. I, I've always read mysteries and loved watching mysteries and the kind of like PBS masterpiece series set in England. Yeah. Um, and so I'd always kind of been fascinated by that. And then the story itself, it felt the same as writing any novel. So I think the fact that there's a crime or a detective um, doesn't change how much kind of work you still have to do on sentences and character psychology and all the rest of it. Um, But I I guess I had always loved mysteries and the idea of um, secrets and someone becoming obsessive and trying to learn the truth. It's just such a compelling structure for a book or a film. Um, You mentioned earlier that uh, your, your love of Narnia probably informed the, uh, the fact that you write your books uh, set in in England now, uh, in Under the Harrow, and and now a, a double life. Uh, what are some of the challenges for uh, someone with an accent like you uh, writing stories about mm-hmm. England? Uh, is it difficult to get in? Uh, uh, and and how do you do research to to make sure that they they ring true? It's funny. It seems. When I wrote my first book, I didn't even really think about it because it just made sense that I read books that are set in other countries and I would want to write books that are different from my own life the way that, you know, I don't only read books about characters who are like me. And the great thing about fiction is that you have kind of an endless budget if it were a movie (laughs) and that you can go anywhere and you can send your characters wherever. And it's just this like great privilege that you can do that. Um, I think for publishing, when I when I started working with a publisher, I realized that uh, it was something where I think people um, sort of love stories where it's autobiographical and it's, you know someone writing about something that they know intimately well. So I don't have that, but I think that the research part was one of the huge joys of writing. So all the things I didn't know about the UK that I got to learn were things that sort of propelled me and kept me interested and fascinated. Um, And just little things like the different foods that people eat and trying things like Marmite um, (laughs) or Walker's crisps or Aero bars. It's, it's just fun. It's just getting to live a different life for a little bit. I love the idea of having an unlimited budget and being able to send your characters anywhere. I, mm-hmm. I, I think all writers uh, are, are kind of nodding their head at, at the, the idea of that. And 
you know, and, and, and the, also the idea that, uh, that, that people may say, oh gosh, um, you know, that this book is, uh, would be so difficult to film, you know, <laughs> because you, you globe up, mm-hmm. um, you know, but those, those are the fun challenges and that's the, um, uh, that, that we writers get to do. We, we literally have a blank canvas and, and can just do it wherever. Uh, and, and also, you yeah. know, you, you hear stories of, uh, of, uh, writers from decades past and, and talking about going to live in a place for six months or a year and then that informing the novel. And, uh, and you definitely should travel and experience things. But, you know, when you're looking for that minor detail, uh, Google is, uh, is a game changer for writers and just being able to get little mm-hmm. details and, and things like that that, uh, have really opened doors. Yeah, the Google Maps satellite feature is just incredible because you can look at every little detail on a street thousands of miles away and see the trees growing on it and the signs out front and, you know, inside shops sometimes. So it it does feel like you have a kind of, um, you know, spy camera installed wherever you want to go. Um, in, in Under the Harrow and uh, A Double Life, you, you've got these characters who are uh, kind of thrust into situations where they have to start unraveling mysteries. And uh, there, there really is this kind of undertone of, of regular people uh, kind of having to step up and use their intellect and their um, – uh, kind of empathy uh, that really shines through. Uh, is that something that that is a, a conscious thing with you, uh, or is, is there? Uh, do you set out to put regular everyday people into these situations and then see how they shine? Mm, that's such a lovely way of phrasing it. That they have to use their empathy and their intellect because I think that's true. You have to sort of wonder why someone would do something and put yourself in their shoes if you're trying to solve a mystery. Um, and yeah, I've always loved the idea of the Holmesian irregular, uh, right. so the amateur sleuth and the person who's just kind of forced to take on a role that they wouldn't have chosen for themselves because I think that lends itself more to drama and suspense sometimes than having someone like a detective who has been trained and has, resources and colleagues it's much more lonely i think if you're just kind of trying to investigate something because it's consuming you but you're not actually hired for the job or trained for the job or skilled for the job and you have all the flaws that um like i would if i were trying to investigate a crime right well and and you also uh get this great sense uh that the the protagonist is is connected in a way that a uh, that maybe a detective would not be, and and we we all know that uh, there are wonderful people in, in law enforcement that that really uh, take cases personally and and really invest themselves in it. But at the end of the day, they get to go home and sleep in their bed and with their family, and and mm-hmm. while this thing is probably nagging at them in the back of their head constantly. Um, uh, you know, because you, you can't help but to get engrossed in things like this, but th- there is a disconnect there because it's not their family and it's not their life. Uh, but when you have this, uh, uh, this person that this happens to, uh, you know, to their sister or, uh, uh, you know, to it, that, that's a whole other level of commitment to the story, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And Detectives in fiction are so satisfying, and I love watching police procedurals. Right. Um, but I think you're right that it's different if you can go home or you know that you're going to have a different job coming pretty soon and that there are other cases that have haunted you in the past um, versus this being the central defining uh, secret in your life or mystery in your life. And it's it's just fun to write characters who – are willing to kind of go to any lengths and willing to kind of um, put themselves in danger or even compromise some of their values to figure out what's actually happened. Right. So Under the Harrow was your, your first novel, and uh, it uh, was received really well. Um, you followed up with your brand new book, A Double Life, and there's a fascinating story behind this book. Um, how did you discover this real-life case, and 
did it just bother you uh, and kind of hang with you until you saw a book coming out of that story? It did. Yeah, I've been curious about it for years. And so the case is the case of Lord Lucan, and he vanished in 1974 and hasn't been seen ever since um, that anyone knows of. And on the night he vanished, two women were attacked in his home in London. So there's uh, a lot of speculation about whether he is guilty, whether he's a murderer, or if he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And the story had kind of circled in my brain for years because there are still sightings of him all over the world that are reported in the UK press. I don't think that it gets much coverage in the US. Um, and then, yeah, it had to sort of nagged at me and nagged at me. And I decided just for fun to try to start kind of researching it and working on a fictional version of it for myself almost as an experiment. And then it just kept going. Um, one thing that's fascinating about this book to me is your exploration of uh, the, the class structure in England. And it's something very foreign to uh, we uh, American citizens. And e even though in our society there are, you know, it's kind of the same thing going on, uh, there are lots of divisions and, and people tend to click up and, uh, and, and things like that. But it's a, in England, it's a very institutional thing, even though it, mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of ways, it's, uh, it's, it's really more symbolic than anything, uh, nowadays, but, but the mm -hmm. symbolism is still very strong and it, it still, uh, is, you know, it's very real. Um, what, uh, what are you doing in this book, uh, to, to kind of address that and to, and how does the, the, uh, the thought of, of the class structure, how does that inform the story? So that idea that it's just institutionalized over there in a way that's different than here is so right. And it is something that becomes the more strange the longer you look at it. So I think when I started working on the book, I didn't think that class would be a huge part of it. But then in my research, it just kept coming up again and again and again in all of these different ways. And it does really define the true crime that the story is based on. So in so many ways, classes in every single kind of layer of the crime and the investigation and the search and the way the media has reported it. So it, it was really fascinating. And that was one thing where I felt like it was a benefit to be an outsider and an American because it just kind of sticks out to you coming from outside the system that it's completely insane that newspapers will still use aristocratic titles when they're talking about people. So they use like, you know, Lord and lady and Viscount and uh, Marchioness, which is, it just seems so outdated. Like it's, it seems like something from a different century. Um, the, uh, your main protagonist in a double life, Claire, uh, is, is the strong, powerful woman, uh, a doctor, but she also has the secret that not a lot of people know in that her father, uh, is, uh, is a suspect for this, this brutal murder and the, the, the murder that, uh, was informed by that real life story. Um, what, uh, what do you get to explore in this book, uh, with that tension? That's a very real tension of, of someone who's trying to move on with her life and to make her mark in the world. Yet there's this thing hanging over her that if, if people knew about it, uh, you know, things would be very different for her. Mm -hmm. So her story feels like a much more dramatic kind of heightened version of something that I think almost everyone deals with at some point where, you have your professional life or your kind of public life in which you can be competent and uh, resourceful and seem kind of calm and balanced and steady. And then oftentimes there's something else going on alongside that. So whether you are getting a divorce or someone in your family is ill or uh, something has happened that you're trying to work through, I just think everyone sort of goes through those times when they're leading a double life and they're trying to sort of cope with two very, very different um, existences at one time. And with Claire's story, it's 
obviously uh, heightened because her father's suspected of this notorious crime. But I just love the idea of what would it be like to still have to go to work and pay your bills and, you know, see your friends and try to be a good sister and girlfriend. And also at the same time, have this kind of huge secret looming over you. Right. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a piece of, uh, of us in all of the characters that we write. And I think uh, readers sometimes confuse uh, when we say that with, uh, oh, oh, you know, is this character you or are, are you, uh, you know, what are you trying to say about yourself in these characters? And it, it, it doesn't mean that, uh, but a lot of times we're very closely connected or, to our characters and some of our traits come out in them or, or sometimes we use them to explore things, you know, that to, to work out things in our own mind and, and that sort of thing. Um, are, are you uh, connected to Claire in any uh, great meaningful way? Is she close to your heart uh, in any way? Definitely. And I think it's true that the ways that a character is autobiographical aren't always obvious at first. So, right. um, you know, sometimes the character in the book that you feel the most similar to is the one that looks the least like you or has the least kind of outward right. uh, similarity to you. Um, with Claire, I think Claire has a huge amount of survivor's guilt at the fact that she uh, has a good life and her family has been kind of destroyed around her by what happened years ago. And um, I think survivor's guilt is something that I think about a lot and that I feel very personally connected to. And just the idea of how do you enjoy things if you know that someone you love has been suffering and how do you kind of cope with feeling like you've sort of managed to escape unscathed um, without then abandoning your own life. Um, your books have been described uh, by some as, as feminist thrillers. Uh, what do you think about that label? So I was so happy to hear that because uh, for a book to be feminist just seems to mean that the women in it feel real. Like I think after someone said that, I was trying to think, okay, of my favorite books, would I describe them as feminist or not? And um, all of them passed the test because – the women in it, whatever they did and whether or not they were considered what we would call it, you know, like a strong character, um, felt realistic and like a woman that I could meet and not just like they were props to kind of move along a story um, in which a man was the hero or the central character. Um, and I think, and then the other probably big piece is that I'm really interested in how women get treated by the criminal justice system as uh, whether or not they're victims or witnesses or suspects, just the ways that women are kind of analyzed um, by the public and the media. Maybe one day we'll get past those labels where women and uh, can can just be real characters because they're real characters, and and we don't mm -hmm. have to uh, say, oh, this is a great book. It's a feminist thriller because the women are real. Um, you know what? We've got a lot of making up to do to, uh, to, uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous that we have to say that when, when all characters ought to just be real. Um, but it's also fantastic when, uh, when a book like yours comes out and it's so obviously well done and, uh, and people stand up and take notice. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just, it feels like a compliment. And sure, yeah, sure. I um, hope that, yeah. Absolutely. Um, Flynn, if people are just learning about your work and, uh, and I highly recommend a double life. I hope everyone goes out and gets their copy. Now it's available, uh, everywhere, uh, on Kindle, hardcover, paperback, audio book, any way that you consume books, a double life is out. Uh, where can people find you online? If, if maybe they want to follow along and, uh, learn more about you and, uh, get to, you know, uh, your previous book. Yep. Uh, I have a website which is my name, so flynnberry.com. And then I also have a Twitter account, which I use mostly to recommend books that I love. So um, I'll usually post a book that I'm reading. 
awesome. Uh, Flynn, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Uh, we're going to put links to a double life, uh, and your website and Twitter in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the author stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. The brutes of the Andersonville Prison Hospital have moved me to the dead room, or so it has come to be known. None so domiciled have yet left this place. We receive only the smallest rations and only cursory care to reduce our odors and spare the nostrils of our keepers. The good Christians of the Confederacy do not see any need to provide comfort to those who will soon sleep soundly enough underground. You must know, at least, how your father came to such an end. At Doctortown, Kilpatrick entrusted me with the conquest of a railroad trestle, and my bummers, my demolition team, acquitted themselves admirably thanks to my ingenuity with powder. We successfully destroyed the trestle work past Morgan's Lake. This would prove to be my entire contribution to the war. Federal troops were unable to capture the bridge or overcome the enemy's battery. Kilpatrick withdrew, and my bummers and I found ourselves on the wrong side of the Altamaha River, behind the enemy line with no hope of reaching our encampment. Rebels accosted us, taking our remaining supplies. We escaped and headed south, hoping by a long march to reach Seymour's forces in Jacksonville, but we encountered other rebel encampments at Jessup. Four of my men were lost to gunfire. We marched west, then south again, barely evading capture. We had no choice but to brave the great swamp Okefenokee. Oh, on and on it goes, in every direction, endlessly. We trudged through miles of grasping mud and noxious rot, pursued by hunger and the mosquito, scratching at our arms and faces until all our skin was scourged. We lived off alligator meat at first, then nothing at all. My men grew mutinous, blamed me for all their misfortunes, threatened to throw me in a sack, weigh me down with stones, and sink my body. Yet was I not equally hungry? Did I not starve? I grew weary of their endless insubordination and contempt. Finally, they took hold of me and swore they would hang me by the neck for leading them to ruin. They were five in number, younger than I and more muscular. I was no match for them physically. They lay their hands on me and I burned them. I burned those men. The flame rose from me as from a volcano, stripping the skin from those boys, blackening their faces, roasting their flesh. And let this be my final ghastly confession. I feasted that night, feasted on the meat of my prospective murderers. And that is how I survived. I staggered alone from that swamp, a mad thing, fueled by outrage and guilt. I saw an encampment of rebel soldiers and surrendered myself gladly. They say in Andersonville prison all men are brothers, equal in filth, equal in terror, equal in ruin. Yet I feel I may claim some small distinction, at least for I am surely damned to a greater extent than any here.